life can get really busy really fast. But how often do we stop? and give thanks for the things we take for granted. Like the fact that you woke up today. Or the clean running water. Or the systems in place so you can drive to work safely. The coworker who got there early and started the coffee. Or the smell of that coffee. Or the guy who held the door for you. There's a family member who waits all day just to see you. And the cashier who let you buy 11 items in a 10 items or less line. The electricity that lets you read way past your bedtime. Or the God who actually thought all this awesomeness up. Life can get really busy really fast, but thankfully, it only takes a moment to say thank you. It only takes a moment to say thanks, and we really do have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? I mean, if we were to pause just for a moment on Thanksgiving Sunday to start going through the list in our heads of what we ought to be thankful for and what we are thankful for, it, it would take more than a moment. But I want you to catch this today. Being thankful does actually more for us Check, check. than the one who we say thanks to. Do you understand that? that? That actually showing gratitude, expressing thankfulness, it does more for the person who's thankful than it does for the one that's being thanked. In fact, it's not just enough for us to be thankful. There's something special about when we take it just a step further and we express that Thankfulness. Oftentimes, thankfulness expressed is something we call gratitude. And it's gratitude, it's the expression of thankfulness that truly has the potential to change us, transform us from the inside out. When we express thankfulness, here's what happens the giver wants to give more. I know that, that when I give my son something and he says a polite thank you, uh, I'm like, wow, that's great that he remembered to say thank you. But, but when his eyes light up and he's truly thankful and expresses that, man, he could ask me for anything and I'd give it to him in that moment. You know, I, I, would, I would go as far as I possibly could. Now, not if I thought for a second that he was expressing his thankfulness to get more from me. But if I saw the authentic heart behind a kid who was truly thankful, it causes the giver to want to give more. When I've been on different mission trips that I've been on, one of the big differences I've noticed compared to children's ministry in North America when you give a kid a prize in North America, uh, they often, when reminded, say thank you. In the Dominican, in the Congo, in, in other parts of the world where they have so little, you, you give them a much smaller prize or reward and they truly light up to the point where you just think, I, I would empty my wallet for you. Like, I, I want to give you more. Here's what happens when you express thankfulness, the giver wants to give you more. And the receiver, the, the person who uh, gets the gift, 
all of a sudden their focus comes off their wants and wishes. That the focus comes off their problems. That their focus comes off their fears. And their focus goes toward the, the giver. It doesn't even always go to the gift. It often goes to the giver. That, that when you receive something that you're truly thankful for, you, you might get all excited in the flash of a moment of the item. But, but then you look up to, to the giver. And, and you express that gratitude. See, when you truly are thankful the giver is motivated to give you more. And the receiver, well, they're, they're refocused. That Their attention comes off their anxiety, their worry, their fret, their fears, all, all of those other things. And at least in a, in a brief moment, they are refocused to the giver. But here's the third thing that happens when we truly express thankfulness. There is a deeper healing that we may not even recognize we need takes place. That there's something that happens inside of us. There's a healing that starts to happen that I want to talk to you about from a, a Bible story uh, today. But, but the Bible story talks about something that, that we have dermatologists for today, skin diseases, right? Um, in the New Testament, all these different skin irritations and rashes and diseases, they're often translated all together as leprosy in the New Testament. And, and they often come with the equivalent of a death sentence. In the Israelite community, when a person discovered a rash or a skin disorder of, of some sort, he or she had to, to go to the priest for examination. Thank you, Jesus, I don't have to do that. <laughs> oh, that would freak me out, you know, if somebody that had all sorts of um, weirdness on their, their skin was coming and say, uh, hey, Pastor Kevin, what do you think of this? Am I, am I good to go, or, or what do I do here? But, but in that day, in the Israelite community, you, you went to the priest. And the priest determined whether this was a contagious disease or whether the person was to be um, uh, declared ceremonially unclean or, or clean. And once the, the priest made this, um, this declaration, if you were deemed to be contagious, if you were deemed to be unclean, uh, you were often sent out to a uh, leper colony, outside of town, outside of the village, away from, from everyone else in an effort to, to stop the spread of the disease. I mean, they weren't trying to be mean to these poor people with skin diseases. They were saying, we got to make sure that, that we all don't get it. You, you got to go. That's, that's contagious. And so they would go and they would form these colonies, these groups of people. And in Luke chapter 17, we read of 10 men who were part of one of these colonies. And at the end of the story, we, we find a healing that takes place not just of a, of a skin disease. We find an inner healing. This is quite interesting. Look with me at Luke chapter 17 if you want to follow along in, in those Bibles that are in the seats uh, in front of you, underneath the seats in front of you. It's page 953, or you can take one of those Bibles. If you don't have a Bible that's easy to read, you feel free to take that for free. And uh, you read later on this afternoon, uh, Luke chapter 17. But right now, let's follow along here. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus always seemed to be moving from one place to another. He was never sitting around bored. It, it, it seemed like he was, he was moving, he was on the move, and he was with a mission. And Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee in this particular story. And he was going into the village before he got inside the village. While he was still outside the village, 10 men who had leprosy come and they meet him. 
They, they stood at a distance because that was the Jewish law, not just a, a tradition or being polite. That, that was the law. You, you couldn't approach someone if you'd been sent to one of these colonies. And so they stand at a distance and they call out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. You, you see their, their heart's condition? I mean, they were probably lonely. They, they had lost everything. They were in this humbled position. And they come to Jesus, to Master, to God. Have pity on us. Show a little pity over here. When Jesus saw them, notice that he didn't go on with a, a whole big sermon. He got to the point and he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. He, 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 didn't, um, he didn't seem to heal them instantly. He, he didn't seem to perform this, this whoosh miracle. He said, turn around, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, while they were walking back to get the priests to check them out, then they were cleansed. See, I find it interesting that again and again in Scripture, Jesus would perform these miracles and he would often say, your faith has made you well. See, these people had to have some faith. Have pity on me. Go. Go back to the priest. But, 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 but you didn't do anything. Shouldn't you have fixed me before I go back to the priest? I'm going to be in big trouble. But they didn't say any of those things. They, they turned and they believed for what they could not see. Catch that? That's what faith is. You've heard me probably say before, every one of us have faith. The question really is, where is your faith pointed today? Are you believing that things are just going to stay the same? Are you believing that things are probably just getting worse and worse and worse and worse? I mean, have you watched the news? Or are you believing what God says? That we already know how this whole thing ends. That we have victory in Christ Jesus. That there is hope that makes no sense. That we have access to a peace that passes all understanding. I mean, when you start to look at those kind of things, you start to say that, 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 hey, I want the kind of faith that is pointed in the right direction. And these guys had faith that was pointed in the right direction. They decided that they were going to head back to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. They were healed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed... It sounds like before he even got to the, to the priest to show them, but, but he saw that he was healed. He came back, one of them, praising God in a loud voice. I mean, he wasn't saying, lucky break. Oh my goodness, the doctors, that, that thing that they gave me must have finally worked. He was saying, praise God. In fact, look at this. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. He was of a group of people who despised the Jewish people of which Jesus was one of. He was, he was the last of all the suspected people that should come back. But isn't it interesting that sometimes it's the people you least suspect that are the closest to God? You know, the, the people that come to church every week, sometimes they can just say, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see what God does. And when God does something, they say, yeah, well, we're, we're sure lucky. What a sad reflection that, that it was the Samaritan, it was the one outside of the group who comes and he says, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. The, the least suspected one. Jesus asked, well, hey, weren't there 10 cleansed? Didn't this work? You know, uh, di didn't they all get cleansed? 
Jesus knew what happened. He, he wasn't doing an investigation here. He was asking a rhetorical question. And he says, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he says to him, rise and go. There's that statement that he uses again and again. He says, your faith has made you well, but here's the problem I've got. He's already been healed. And yet after the healing takes place, he comes back to Jesus, the leper does, and says, thank you. Falls on his knees. And after all this, Jesus gives him not only an opportunity to be thankful, he gives them an opportunity for a deeper kind of healing. See, often when Jesus would perform miracles, there was two miracles that happened. There was a physical miracle and a spiritual miracle. And here's the deal with thankfulness. When we are thankful, truly thankful, not, not just verbally thankful or internally thankful, but, but when we're genuinely, authentically thankful and we express that thanks to God, the giver feels like giving us more. And, and as a receiver, our focus comes off of the disease, it comes off of the problems, it comes off of the mess, it comes off of the circumstances, it comes off of our fear, it comes off of our anxiety, it comes off of our worry, it comes off of our disappointment, and it goes to the giver. The, the giver who just feels like giving us more and more, and, and our focus, we're, we're relieved, but, but when we actually express that thankfulness... We actually express that thankfulness. There's a spiritual healing that also takes place. And so we've got uh, this opportunity today on Thanksgiving Sunday to, to thank God, first of all, for what he's already done, but also to thank God for, for believing that he is going to do some things that you have not yet seen just like in this story. Faith is, is believing for what you cannot see. And some of you have been wishing for, wanting for, and asking for things for a long time, but believing that nothing's ever going to change. And today we've got an opportunity to be thankful for what has already changed and to start being thankful for what you're believing for. And so will you stand with me? Will you actually pray with me as you bow your heads and close your eyes? May this be an act of participation, not just you waiting for me to finish, but a heavenly Father, God, not just I, but we stand before you. And we come before you as a people who are thankful. We are thankful for what you have already done. God, we thank you for health and strength and life and vitality. We, we thank you for energy. We thank you for love and we thank you for relationships. We, we thank you for what you have already done. We thank you for the years that we did have with that loved one. We thank you for the good times and the laughter we did have with even that broken relationship. God, we thank you for the good years with the children. God, we thank you for the, the good times. We thank you for the laughter and we thank you for the blessings that we did have. But right now, God, we also thank you. As we believe for what we cannot see, we thank you for restoration. God, we thank you for healing that is taking place. We thank you for love that is being rekindled. God, we thank you for impossible things that you say are possible. We thank you for victory in Jesus. We thank you that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We thank you that we can believe in a God who changes things. That, that in faith, God, this day, we thank you for what we see you've done. And we thank you 
for what we believe you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray.